Hello and welcome to the Take Charge podcast. I'm joined today by Todd Peters, who's been a senior leader at the likes of Intel, Microsoft, and most recently Breitbart, where he spent nine years as the CEO and chairman. His experience of leading agile startups as well as large companies alongside leaders such as Andy Grove has allowed him to gain a really unique perspective. Todd imparts career and culture advice during two sections of this conversation. The first part is all about providing career advice to battery professionals. So do I stay in academia or go into industry? Do I join a small or a large company? How can I develop and thrive as a professional in the battery space, etc., etc.? In the second section, Todd shares his stories and advice on how to build a culture for success in the battery industry. I really enjoyed this conversation and took a lot from it, and we hope you do too. So Todd, it's time to take charge. So Todd, thank you for joining me on the show. You're welcome, Jamie. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this one, talking all things uh, career development at the beginning. I think there'll be a lot for um, people at any stage of their career in the battery space to, to take from it. Um, and then on the other side, culture. So you've obviously got a, a great track record of, of developing culture and nurturing culture. So yeah, I'm excited to, to get started. Um, so let's start with, with you, first of all, Todd. You've had a, a very interesting career ranging from Fortune 100s to, to startups. So um, yeah, tell me a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so my journey um, early on, I sort of decided that technology moved at a pace that was exciting to me and interesting. And I knew that I wanted to be, I was not a technology, so I was actually a psychology major. Uh, and I was asked early on, Did you, were you not interested in technology? I said, no, I was interested in the people that made technology. And I put together sort of a Venn diagram very early on, and I put in people in one circle, place in another, and product in the third. And the criteria for each of those, for people, I want to work with great people. I want to work with the smartest, most competent, uh, most innovative people uh, that I could surround myself with. With places, there were definitely places I wanted to be. Uh, in this case, it was New York City, then it was San Francisco and Silicon Valley, uh, outside of Boston and here in Redmond, Washington, where, when I was at Microsoft. And then um, products, I was interested in any products, really, semiconductors, software, technology services, and then for the last 10 years, really interested in energy storage. So I sort of lined these things up. And once you did, in the center of that Venn diagram, there weren't a ton of companies. Um, that that sort of fit all three of those criteria. So I sort of bounced between those and made quite a few industry changes. I was always interested in batteries. Uh, batteries was sort of the Achilles heel. When I was at Intel, I worked in mobile computing and laptops, and the consumer experience was, was denigrated by poor battery performance. Um, I worked on the GM EV1 in marketing and launching the first electric car. I worked on mobile and phones at Microsoft. So batteries always seemed to come around and eventually um, I got a call to run a battery company and that's what took me to 10 years basically in energy storage. Perfect. Um, and obviously you mentioned there uh, Breitbart for the, for the last nine years before that Microsoft, Intel, uh, Staples as well. Um, what's been the largest, uh, sort of the largest organization that you've run and, and then of course the smallest as well? Yeah, so the largest would have been at Microsoft, and um, we had several hundred people, maybe 250 people in my organization. We had a budget, of, believe it or not, of $400 million, which everyone on my team thought wasn't enough to go around. <laughs> um, so that was the largest, and there's pros and cons of running an organization of that size. Uh, and the smallest was two or three people with almost no marketing, no budget, uh, operational budget to speak of. Mm. Yeah, so full one of those, Yeah, one of those 400 million would have been nice in, in that sort of a setup. In batteries, certainly. Perspective, yeah. Um, good stuff. And then, so we're getting a bit deeper into performance characteristics. So kind of what makes a real top performer. So um, what were some of the top um, kind of performance characteristics that you saw um, across the different companies um, that made you and all the people that worked for you successful? Yeah, so the common denominator I've seen across various industries, various size companies with different company cultures 
uh, I put a high priority on integrity. And mm-hmm. when I have managers or peers that daily represents or manage their behavior and performance with a high degree of integrity, that goes a long way. So mm-hmm. being accountable um, and owning sort of your mistakes. Uh, I've met a lot of people that really were terrified to admit they made mistakes. I've always felt that, look at if, you know, the pr- team proves me wrong, that's great. We just get smarter. Um, so I think that, that integrity was, was really important to me. Um, project management skills, uh, organizational planning, uh, hitting your timelines, being very crisp about what your objectives are, what are your resources that you need. Um, these are types of behaviors uh, uh, that are around um, really the the ability to get things done and to get them done when you need a team, request a team. When you can do it independently, do it independently. Um, the, the, and, and showing versatility in that project management. So really good people across the board you can throw a lot of different things at them and they have a methodology. They have an approach to their work that has made them successful in large teams or small teams. So I find that that, that project management and integrity are two sort of requirements. Um, the third one is communication. And this can be difficult. I've run global teams uh, where English is you know a fourth or fifth language. Um, so it's not necessarily verbal communication always, but the ability to... Um, to articulate what is happening on your project, the ability to write clearly, and the ability to present it in such a way that it's compelling. And you get other people uh, engaged in what it is that you are trying to do. So I think those are sort of three of the major sort of behavioral characteristics that I've seen across the board that have made people really successful. Mm. listening would go on the communications yeah you made an interesting point at the end so someone could have an amazing concept an amazing theory but not have the ability to bring people along with them um so yeah i I find that has been true in technology often um the area of development is communication and that is it's particularly hard for introverts um and you have to pay attention as a manager to the introverts because they can do great work, but they just are not comfortable talking about it. And I've had some managers that just didn't speak. Uh, mm-hmm. Really difficult. They're very comfortable in a lab, uh, but they really didn't want to say anything in a conference room. And to move forward, to move up in an organization, you have to be able to to sort of sell a vision. You have mm-hmm. to present data. You have to present your results with conviction and you have to debate them because they're always going to be challenged in any environment. Mm. So how would someone work on that? So, you know, typically if someone is a battery engineer, battery scientist, they're coming from academia, they're, they're quite technical. Um, you'd maybe argue that those individuals might not be necessarily extroverted uh, versus someone in a commercial position. So how would someone, if they, if they aspire to be, um, maybe a people leader or kind of work in a more commercial fashion, how, how would they work on those skills to, to improve? Yeah, there's been all kinds of, of, of ways. And the first thing I've noticed, uh, and these are a lot of recent postdocs, that they're not really aware how mm. much, how important that is in a company, in a commercial enterprise, um, their communication skills. They don't typically write, put much thought into the writing or into their speaking. So usually it often starts with a a 90 day review with me or one of their managers. And we tell them this is an area to develop and they're sometimes a little bit put back. Well, my technology is great. Yes, it is, but you gotta be able to share that with the team. You gotta delegate that to the team or you gotta manage up accordingly. Um, So we've done things from going back to Toastmasters to having uh, an individual she had to present at, at my staff meeting once a month and just develop a muscle. All these things are muscles. I mean, the, 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 what I failed to mention, everybody's smart. And I think everyone's smart at Intel, everyone was smart at Microsoft, at Breitbart. We all have very high IQ individuals. So these are some of the softer sides that we need to develop over time and they're muscles. I mean, there's no reason 
you know, for um, not having good project management skills. It, it's not nearly as difficult as it is being a polymer chemist uh, or working on an advanced electrolyte material. Hmm. Not very good. If we can help the hyper intelligent people be able to articulate the technology and kind of what they're doing to bring people on with them, then that's great. Because unfortunately, the, uh, there's some people who aren't as intelligent who can generate some momentum. So <laughs> we, need to, right. we need to help those guys. Um, and j just on that point, so how would you, so a lot of kind of battery professionals, they're not sure whether to stay within academia. So pursue a, a career in academia versus going into industry. So, you know, how would someone assess whether they would enjoy either? Um, and how would someone assess which path to take? Coming out of academia? Yeah, whether to stay in academia or move into industry in the battery. Field. Yeah, so that, it's an interesting transition. And some navigate it extraordinarily well and, and others don't. Um, what my advice would be to talk to lots of people. To get to know people that have those roles at those size companies, go to these big industry events, listen, meet people, do that networking piece, and really try to understand how's it different? How is commercial enterprise? And the usual typical challenge is focusing on commercialization of technology. And academia has gotten better at it. They've become more savvy about IP generation and spinning out the IP. So I believe that's that's changing over time in a way that's more consistent with the expectations in a commercial enterprise. I have had folks from academia who were fascinated by the technology, but weren't really interested in customers. Didn't really want to talk to customers, didn't want to know the understanding of the customers, they didn't want to know the customer's pain points, the end user's pain points, um, they didn't, you know, an example would be they'd come up with something that worked really well, very excited to show me the data. And then I'd ask about some of the components or elements or chemistry, and they weren't sure uh, the availability, the cost, the scalability, where they're going to come from. I said, don't, just don't, guys, don't bring anything out of the lab that we can't scale. Um, I'm not, not interested. I think it's, it's super cool. You guys can do that on your own time. But we're a company and I can't have, you know, this super rare material and take it to customers and say, you know, it's going to cost, you know, 10x what's available on the marketplace today. So I think that kind of mindset, um, if you're transferring from uh, academia, I've had other people that totally got it and stepped right in and did a fa fabulous job with with customers. So I think it depends a little bit on their orientation and their interest level. Um, and that can help either make the private sector a, a good place uh, or a very challenging place because they don't want to hear what the customer wants. That's that's that typically when I have a meeting, and we get beat up by a customer and then we, we go and we have discussions with the R&D team. That, that's that's not ter terribly enjoyable if it's divergent from where their technical interests and plans lie. Mm. As you we were saying before, it's it's a muscle. So I imagine someone would get better at it. So if someone was, you know, uh, an academic and they weren't really interested in what the customer wanted, but could I imagine train themselves with someone like you to understand? Okay, we have a technology, but we need to think about these five elements before we take it out of the lab and and, and pitch it to anyone. Um, but I guess you have to assess what your priorities are, and I guess kind of what you believe in the most is that. I was, I was going to ask what characteristics would lean towards staying in academia or um, or going into industry. Would it be your characteristics or would it be your maybe beliefs and values that would be the most important things to assess? I can't speak to, um, to, to specifically as I never worked in academia. Um, I have recruited out of academia and I think the, the common denominator, and this would apply from the Fortune 100s or going from a Breitbart sized company to a Fortune 100, is, is sort of an intellectual curiosity. So when I've seen people come out of academia that did really well, um, they wanted to go to business development meetings. 
they, they wanted to know what our strategies were. They wanted to know what our fundraising strategies were. I mean, stuff way outside of their wheelhouse because they were just curious people. And I think if you're a curious person, um, yeah, and, and you want to learn a lot of different disciplines, then then that that again that transition can be can be quite interesting. If you really want to stay focused, then academia may be a better way to go. Brilliant. <clears throat> and on a similar topic, are there any performance characteristics that would help someone thrive in a in a large company versus a, a small one? You've obviously had the experience of leading in in both. Yeah, I think in a large company, and this is a, it's hard to make the parallel with the energy storage industry because they're not profitable. Public companies are, the stocks are bouncing along the bottom. Uh, they're years from reoccurring revenue. So it's quite different, but at, use a, I'll use Microsoft as an example. You need advocacy across the organization. You need visibility across a massive organization. When I was there, it was 110,000 employees. So, so by doing so, um, the way it works is you need other business unit heads to say, yeah, I know this, this person on your team. That I think they're really great. And they work really effectively with my team. Um, so it is more political. And some people don't want to do that outreach. And particularly, again, going to the introverted side, let them get them to talk to their own teams can be difficult. Get them to go to a different business unit and begin to build a reputation across a massive organization takes a lot of self-advocacy. And that uh, I've seen a lot. Um, the people that did really well at Intel, the people that did really well at Microsoft, it's a part of the business or, or you know culture that I didn't particularly enjoy. Um, I, I didn't really feel like someone that's in five business units away, what their opinion of my team members wasn't really as important as, uh, you know, their peers in our group that were actually doing the work. So that takes, I think, a different mindset and, and skill set is to make sure that you are building bridges across a, a broad matrix organization, which obviously in a small company, you don't need to do. Everybody knows you. Mm. Um as a leader, what have you preferred? What environment? Uh, smaller. Uh, I I felt like the, I guess there's there's two things. I, I like smaller because I like to do things. Um, I felt the more senior job roles that you have in a Fortune 100, there's a tremendous amount of, of administrative oversight that was taxing on me that I didn't enjoy. I literally enjoyed working, we had a manufacturing line, being on the line, learning the line, building batteries, being in the lab. We were so agile. The, the other thing about the, the corporate, I was presenting uh, to a Fortune 100 probably about six months ago. They brought in probably 15 people. At the beginning of the meeting, I asked who the decision makers were. And I only did that because I'd been in their chair. I mean, I knew it. they're so matrix. No one really has Everyone can say no. Very few people can say yes. That also bothered me. So the agility uh, of a small company and, and really the execution, the focus on execution was more appealing to me. And the, the, the consensus ability, the ability to make decisions and to be agile. We we're dealing with a, a large uh, Korean battery company. And they said, when can you give us a decision? I said, uh, probably in about 30 minutes. And I said, you're kidding. I said, no, it's us. We don't have to go to the board. We're going to make the decision and we'll get right back to you. That that would have been six, nine months in a large company to get alignment. So it, it depends on, I think they're great training. For me personally, I wanted to do more and to be closer to the work, not further away from it. Mm. Let's move on to management. Um, sure. Don't have to name any names, of course. Maybe the good ones, but um, what what have you learned from some of your best and, and worst managers over the years? Yeah, so great management. Um, of all the managers I've had, I'd say two I would put into great, and they went on to do great things. Um, and I obviously learned learned a ton from them, but I also 
wanted to follow up on sort of the cliche of standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I knew I wasn't going to be an industrial or technical giant, but I knew when I went to Intel that Dr. Andy Grove was. And I lived on the fifth floor of, of R&B in Santa Clara, and Andy's cube was down the way from mine. So I w didn't know, I was a mid-level manager. I didn't know Andy personally. I certainly presented to him many times, um, but his aura and his ability and his, his, um, his insights permeated the entire culture of Intel. And I thought, man, I can learn an awful lot from Andy Grove. And so I think it's having good managers and um, recognizing what makes them good, sort of file away. Same thing I did with bad managers. I was like, I, God, I'm making notes. I will never be this way, or I'll try not to ever be this way. Um, and then good managers do the same thing. What are the characteristics of that manager? Do, do you like that they um, you know, uh, are, are very, very, um, I won't say micromanaging, but very involved in your day-to-day, -day, or do you like that you have some latitude? Different people like different sort of uh, micro environments based on their managers. So uh, the characteristics of the two that I would mention, um, one of their th dynamics was they evolved under the time that I worked for them in really dynamic and powerful ways. And they, they were rock stars before I got there, before I worked for them. And there's a lot of people that have worked under them. The vast majority would say that they were they were outstanding managers, um, but I saw them change at the time I worked for them based on feedback. So they were, they had the ability and the, the 360 self-awareness to get better at what they do. Conversely, bad managers never see their blind spots. Even if they do 360 reviews, they don't accept it. And their sense of ego is massive. Um, I've had too many poor managers to, to, uh, to, to go on about but I did learn a lot um, from those managers. And, you know, the cliche is you'll learn as much from the bad ones as the good ones. I was thinking about that a little bit, and I've concluded that's probably true. And I think what it is is pattern mapping after the good ones and avoiding to the extent that you can some of the behavioral characteristics of the, of the, the weaker managers. And one of the examples I gave before is owning your mistakes. I've had managers in cultures that were so terrified that they were ready to throw anyone under the team, under the bus, their peers, other customers, instead of saying that they made a bad call. The good managers will say that because they have so much self-confidence and self-awareness that they're going to get better through that experience. So I think there's a, there's a little bit to be said about you want more good ones than bad ones. The, the great ones are rare. Find them, work for them understand what makes them great. And if you don't have that natural ability, which I don't think many people do, I know I don't, um, pattern map that and, and mm -hmm. try and copy it because it's, uh, it's rare and, and I think it's effective over time. Very good. Um, so, so you reported into Andy Groves at one, at one time? No, I didn't. I was mid-level. I reported to, I was probably two or three levels down from Andy. Wow. But it was Intel, you had access to Andy. Andy had this very peculiar <laughs> had this very peculiar behavior. He'd walk around with his tray and he'd pop into your cube and I, he had a very deep voice. He said, Todd, what have you done today to make Intel a great company? And the first time he did it, I absolutely was speechless. I, I, I <laughs> don't think I had an answer. And whatever I came up with, I didn't think it sounded like I really it was really... Uh, making Intel a great company. Um, it was what I happened to be doing. But so Andy was, um, he was, he was quite accessible to, to all levels of the organization. Very good. He, um, d does he narrate um, the Netflix No Rules Rules? I don't know if you've heard that, that um, no. kind of e-book. E I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's Andy Grows, but really, really fascinating, the whole kind of leadership ethos and things like that but that's uh, that's amazing i'll have to check it out i mean his book only the paranoid survive is still to this day one of the best yeah. business book that's ever written uh strategic inflection points exact copy manufacturing the intel and side program a andy you know in every discipline he was extraordinary mm. 
You made um, a really interesting point before. You, you saw them evolve over the time that you were working with them, taking on board feedback and changing as a result. Um, I read something the other day that, that said the best leaders are those that, that never think they're the finished article. You know, they never really see themselves as a great leader. They're always, they're always studying leadership and always kind of understanding how they can become better, whether that's through self-study or, or 360 feedback. Um, so now very, very interesting. And as you say, sometimes taking on board the, the feedback, but not really listening to it and, you know, being stubborn to, to change. That's Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, and what about mentors? So, um, is it important to seek mentors and, you know, what's the best way to actually find one? Yeah, I, I think in, in any industry, in any vocation, uh, mentorship is, is critical. Um, and finding a mentor that the relationship grows to be organic. We had mentorship programs at a variety of the, the large companies I worked at, and it was sort of awkward. You, you'd get on a call or you'd have a one-on-one. -on -one. You didn't know this person. They might be in a different geography, in a different business unit. They didn't really know you or what you were dealing with. And I encourage uh, there's great mentors out there. There's some people that are just natural mentors. I've had mentors that were at my level or junior to my level in certain areas where they just seem to have an amazing perspective. So I think being aware, and it doesn't have to be a super senior person. It, it could be a peer that in certain instances can provide you with some guidance and perspective that you get so tunnel focused that's very difficult for you to do. So I think that um, mentorship uh, needs to be sought out. And again, if you're, intro you're an introvert, it's very difficult. So a lot of times you have the senior management reach out to the introverts and say, I'm gonna, you know, uh, it gives you a, a voice. For me, uh, there's a board member that was amazing mentor that took off his board hat and would give me counsel on a real wide variety of topics and didn't, I could be very candid with my, you know, thoughts and the next board meeting, none of that was on the table. It was very confidential. We never talked about it being confidential. It was just a natural sort of mentoring style. So I would encourage in any size organization, and they could be outside of your organization, find a mentor. And if you're running a small company and you have introverts, get someone that's outside of their direct line of management to talk to them, to give them a sounding board. Uh, it'll increase their engagement. It'll grow them. I always tell them, look, look talk to someone. If you want to have a better understanding, I'm working with, with this person, maybe talk to this person because they are well outside of that realm and they've managed to develop really constructive relationships across the organization. So I, I think it's imperative and it's one of those things you're like, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Everyone's super, super stressed. Make time for it. Absolutely make to make it once a month coffee with somebody that, that can help you get perspective. You'll grow and they grow. I, I, I find mentoring is great. I always learn, uh, particularly out of recent college grads. I love talking to them. Um, I feel like they're mentoring me to stay current, stay aware, connected. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask the frequency, but once a month, um, catching up. Would you advise it to be quite natural? So, giving them an update on you know some daily activities, how things have gone, maybe how you're feeling about certain things, running upcoming decisions by them. You know, what what would you say is the key element to a successful mentor and relationship? So, I, I think, the, in the way I've managed it, this is another intelism, is. I would let them open with some questions. What's on their mind? And often they'll hold back because of my seniority. Um, but I tell them, you know, to get the most use out of this, the more sort of specific um, they can be and what's on their mind and, and more candid and transparent, the more I might be able to help untie the knot, whatever whatever's happening. I would say... That's unusual. I've had some that have come in that just absolutely unloaded. Uh, I think that's the rarity. I think more typically then I start asking questions. And, and typically I know a little bit more about what's going on and maybe what's on their minds. So if they don't want to bring it to the forefront, 
But I always give them the option because that way they can frame it the way they're comfortable with. Um, they're not defensive. They're not on their heels. They're getting to drive the the discussion and the structure of the discussion. But if they can't get to it and they want to, you know, hit a couple of platitudes, then I'll tend to dig a little bit deep with with my questioning. Mm. I've I've heard that intro before. What's what's on your mind is a really good opener as opposed to how are you or how are things because it does gem, genuinely make you think about okay what what is on my mind what am I thinking it could it could mean a few different things but a good opener uh, for sure yep. that's that's interesting. Um, we'll we'll touch on any kind of closing thoughts at the end kind of career advice at the end but let's move on to culture. Um, sure. So you know really good for anybody who. He's a leader in the business and is looking to define culture. They could be in a in an established business and looking to maybe change, or it could be a brand new company where they're looking to establish what their culture is and you know what they're going to do over the coming years. Um, but let's define what it is. Kind of what first of all, from your perspective, what is uh, company culture and why does it matter? Yeah, I probably don't have the the uh, textbook definition, but to me, it's really about the beliefs, the attitudes the standards and the behaviors of an organization. So I think that probably is close to, I know there, there's some subcultural definitions, but generally it, it's, it's about the beliefs and behaviors of a company or an organization. Good stuff. And a question I get asked sometimes in the battery field is, um, you know, is, is company culture important or more important than their technology or IP? Um, and I think it's a fair question from from your perspective. Obviously, you've come from from many innovative businesses and obviously for the last nine years with Brightvolt. Um, is culture less important in highly innovative companies and, you know, where IP and technology is obviously really key? It, it, it's an age old debate. Um, there are technologists and I know them. I've worked with them. I've hired them um, that believe that their technology is so good. Nothing else matters. And we heard that a lot. Um, you don't hear that as much anymore because batteries are tough. But I heard that a lot in Silicon Valley where strategy and culture didn't matter as much as the technology. And they used to say, well, we're, we're 50 years ahead of the competition. Are you? Um, so I think that, that they're intrinsically linked. And one of the, I think, um, components of culture is retention attraction of top talent, of providing an environment where people can do their best work and they want to stay there and they want to work there. Um, that to me is a way to harness the value of the IP and, and bring it to life and grow a great company. If you just have culture and everyone's super rah-rah and all these things, that are um, superficial in my mind without great underlying technology, your company's going to fail. Um, so I think there's, in my mind, they are intrinsically linked and you have to care and feed and put equal emphasis on culture as well as technology. Mm. It's going back to what we talked about earlier. If, someone could have an uh, amazing ideas and concepts and things, but if they can't articulate it well enough, then people don't listen, people don't come along for the journey. And I think there's a similar um, scenario there with culture. So the technology might be amazing and there's, you know, it's a, it's a great concept, but if the culture isn't there to, to nurture that idea and, 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 and turn it into a reality, then, you know, it's pointless. Um, exactly. And, you know, if it's, if something is super innovative um, and there is a culture where people don't listen or challenge uh, and ultimately therefore don't um, innovate, then it's only going to be so good. Whereas actually if there is a culture um, to help that technology evolve, then ultimately it's going to be way better than anyone ever thought it was going to be in the first place. So yeah, I think it can be overlooked in, in kind of highly technical markets. Um, but as you say, it can be an amazing culture, but if the technology is not there, it's not going to, it's not going to work out. Um, so, um, what, I mean, what is more important kind of culture, strategies, technology, would you put them even, um, and that's a difficult question. 
Yeah, I, I think going back to the, the first that they're intrinsically linked, put strategy in there as well. Um, so I, I think that you have to, and I think that's the job that needs to be bottoms up and tops down. All three of them need to be sort of um, thoughtful and data driven and a real sense of execution by, by the team. If someone once said execution is a strategy, I don't, I don't know um, whether I completely agree with that, but I don't think if you have great technology, great uh, culture, and you don't have a strategy, it's not going to work. You're, you're going to miss them. If you don't understand the markets that you're competing in and, and you don't have a really thoughtful strategy on your differentiation, on your value proposition, on your go to market, all these things will absolutely tank your business. So I, I think it's a three legged stool. Um, and they're, the problem is every now and then a company will say, OK, we're going to do a strategy offsite. This is our strategy. Uh, strategy needs to be every day, every meeting, every discussion, every decision that you make should be sort of tied back to strategy, should be tied back to culture, should be tied back to the, the technology. So I think one of the things that people miss is it's not they're not isolated conversations. They need to be activated every day in all of your behaviors and as much as you possibly can. You need to infuse every meeting, every decision with those three sort of targets in, in mind. Otherwise, I think companies miss it because they're like, OK, now it's strategy week. Let's go whack strategy at an offsite and let's bring in McKinsey to talk strategy. I don't think that's the best. I think you need to do have really crisp strategy. And then in smaller companies, you need agility. You need to make changes very, very quickly on your strategy so spending three weeks in an offsite for a small company is, in my mind, uh, unless you really don't know what you're doing, um, is, is probably not the best use of time versus, OK, we're going to have to pivot here a little bit on our strategy and sort of go this direction or that direction. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess they all feed into each other. So, you know, you have your technology. If you have an open culture, um, then everyone's challenging it and it gets better. Um, if you have good strategy then everyone knows where they're going and everyone's really super excited about it, which creates a great culture, uh, a super enthusiastic culture, very positive that then feeds into the technology. Um, would you advise that all three elements are constantly changing or at least open to change? Um, or would you fix any of them? Uh, well, in, in battery development, there's such long planning horizons and there's so much testing required that I think you you sort of need a, a pretty detailed uh, technology roadmap. Um, and software is much easier to pivot around, but semiconductors too. I think you, you need a multi-year roadmap, and you largely need to to stay focused to that. I tend to get excited about other things. And I think a really a good counter to that is typically an R&D lead who needs to remind me, this is why we're on this course. And I think a lot of CEOs probably suffer from that. They'll be at a conference or someone will mention something, they'll read an article or they'll go to Asia, they'll see something really cool and come back with a whole new idea. And then you need some very disciplined people to walk you off the edge to say, we have the right technology roadmap. Let's just stay, stay focused on it. Mm. Interesting. So that's, that's been different in batch technologies compared to, to software. In the semiconductor. Yeah. Battery technology. I mean, the, the challenge is, it is the long horizons. I think uh, it's been said that from lab to market is a 15 year horizon. Um, I think that's largely true. So I think it's a, a sort of a unique case where as other industries, you can, you know, you can put a thousand dev software developers on a project overnight, literally overnight at, at Microsoft 
and you can make some make some changes and, and bring some some innovation. That's not going to happen in in energy storage. Mm. Oh, very good. And then, on what role? Obviously, it's a, a hot topic in the market: diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, from your perspective, what role does it play in defining and and, and their supporting culture? Yeah, that's another one, Jamie. That it. I always felt like sometimes, and this is predates even calling it DEI, it, it's the way the companies that I worked on put a high priority on diversity, equity, and inclusion going back years. Um, it needs to be ingrained in the way that you do things. It cannot be, now we're going to have an HR meeting on DEI, uh, or now we're going to talk about DEI. There needs to be objectives. There needs to be clearly communicated objectives. It needs to be in your recruiting process. It needs to be in your retainment and your 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 promotion um, performance reviews. All of these things, I think, it needs to be deeply integrated into the company culture and the company operations, so that it's really effective. We all, you know, not on your podcast, we all know the benefits of DEI, um, and, and they're clear, um, and they're they're proven. And I think when companies don't activate them, and this is when I goes back to like activating the culture all the time, then I think that's where where they tend to get lost. Mm, yeah, I think the big thing is just open mindedness and that uh, 360 feedback. You know, a company could be doing something well, really well, and when it comes to DE and I, but could always be doing something better. And that's that's the same for every single individual. You know, I think someone who is a DEI practitioner. Uh, knows they're not the finished article and things will always continue to evolve and they'll continue to open the mind. So that's, um, that's interesting. Um, you've obviously moved into businesses and then you've been, I don't know, maybe tasked to change culture or affect it in some way. Um, can you really understand the company culture before you've worked there for, say, six months? And you know, when do you think is the right time to change uh, company culture? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So no, I don't think you can learn, really understand a company culture or a group culture until you're there for six months. You can ask good questions. Um, you can spend some time in interviews, spend days, a day or two with the company. It's You're not going to really know what the culture is like. Um, talking to ex-employees is a good idea. But for me, um, I would go in and learn about the culture. There's probably some good things in, 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 in Several of my most recent roles, I was brought in to turn around the culture. So I was informed by the board or the executives hiring me um, that, you know, the culture in this team needs some work. So I think understanding what's good about a culture before you dismantle it as a senior person, but you don't have to be senior. I think one of the things that's not well understood is, in, and again, this more applies to large companies, build your own subculture. We had great teams in really bad cultures. We had great teams and we had a great culture, super supportive, super positive, super collaborative. And it was us against the world. It was us against other Microsoft business units. It was us against the competition. And my team would do anything for each other. They were, they were super accountable to each other and they had good sense of humor. Even though things were extraordinarily challenging, um, they, they had a positive outlook and disposition so I think subcultures are really important and you can, you can build them at any level. Um, find your peers, your, your subordinates, your direct managers, and, and figure out what, what, what's wrong with the culture that you're, or the team that you're in and how can you improve it? Um, when I got to a company, I was doing this cross business unit one-on-ones and a person told me your organization has been a dumping ground for low performers. <laughs> and I, I just uh, taken this role. I was like, wow, uh, that's interesting. I did not know that. Um, and it turned out to be correct. And I ended up um, talking to the president of the company and he said, go across the company, handpick whoever you want. And I didn't know anybody, but that's where sort of your, your reputation is really key. People knew who the good people were and a lot of them I got to come to work on the team. So I think it takes time. I think for senior management coming in and, and blowing everything up is not my style. 
my style is to sort of lay back a little bit, uh, learn the people, learn the technology, learn what works about the culture, and then dismantle the things that don't work mm-hmm. and and uh, build something new. And I'll just tell you one other e- example. I think culture in a smaller company, um, at Breitbart, we had the employees decide what the culture was. I, I never thought culture should be tops down. It needs to be role modeled. They have to be in my sort of belief set as well. Um, but we really did sort of a fundamental exercise where, and we had an extremely diverse uh, uh, group of employees from all over the world. Uh, just diversity was, was, was renowned. So I wanted to see what they decided were the common grounds, the common threads that they wanted in, in a culture that they work for. And they were all surprised and um, uh, quite a few from, from, from Asia. Uh, if you work for a Korean battery company, you're, you're not asked to define the culture as a battery scientist or a lab tech. Mm. We had every single level had equal weighting and, and they came up with four values that really describe um, the company. And I was really proud of it. I thought these are great. I totally get them. I'm totally bought in. And then it wasn't, they own it. So they had to behave that way. These weren't things that they were described on their orientation. Now, we also, in our evaluations for new hires, we have cultural fit. It's based on those four values. So, and every single person at all level has the ability to score the applicant after spending a day with them on our company values that they defined for the most part. So I think there was a real sense of ownership that executive management didn't have to get everyone on board and say, this is our culture. They told me this is our culture. And I think that's a luxury that you can have in a small company that as you scale in the number of seats, it becomes team members, it becomes much more difficult. Interesting. So so how did you do that? Did you get everyone together? Was it kind of an offsite thing? Was it a project? Yeah, it was an offsite was... thing that I sort of managed. I said, you know, because we weren't going to hire consultants to do this. I, I said, I'm, I'm sort of partial as an employee, but I'm also going to moderate this. And we literally put up every value that we could think of um, on sticky yellow cards and put them all over a conference room. And then every single one went up and said, you got to put your top four. And the top four, which was diversity, was one. Uh, integrity was two. Passion was three. And persistence was four. And I thought, man, those are great. The passion and persistence, if you don't have that in batteries or any industry, if you don't have integrity and diversity, um, that's not a culture I want to work in. So I've worked in some great cultures and some bad cultures. The characteristics and the behaviors and the beliefs that, that the team brought forward we're very consistent with the best cultures that I've worked in. Wow, very good. Um, I was actually going to give you a bit of a scenario question, uh, but I think you probably just sure. laid out the perfect uh, the perfect solution. Um, but let's see if you can uh, maybe add to it. So let's say you've just joined a new company, maybe 20, 30 people, Series A, Series B uh, in, in the batch technology space, uh, and you've come in as the first non-academic leader. Um, and you are obviously going to scale the company. So walk me through how you'd strategize developing a culture for success in that, in that environment. And you can obviously use that. Yeah. So I, I went through that. So I, when I went to, there was Solicor before it was Brightbolt and there was a manufacturing facility in Lakeland, Florida that made low capacity, thin film batteries, solid state batteries. They're pretty interesting. Um, and I spent time, first of all, the board that hired me, you know, they had some thoughts about the culture. And then I talked to everybody from the machine shop. I I got as much from the people working in the machine shop as I did from the executive team. And that's where maybe my psychology degree, maybe my study on company culture for so many years at at some real blue chip companies um, came into play. I probably asked a lot of questions that that they weren't expecting that were on the softer side as, as culture is sort of considered versus the technology. And I begin to paint a picture in my head about what's going on here. And, you know, it, it really is just talking to people. 
I, I don't, I guess you in big companies, you can do a survey, but we have 40, 50 employees. Uh, I talked to the people that were considered the, you know, the, the strong performers. And I talked to the under performers and I heard a lot of things that I didn't like, um, that didn't work. And by that, um, I changed sort of the performance evaluations of people. I put some different things on there. Um, R and D and manufacturing couldn't get along at all. I gave R and D and manufacturing target for their performance evaluation. I gave manufacturing an R and D target, and they're like, "We have to work together." And I said, "Yeah, I think you do. I, I think you're going to have to really change the way you work um, in order to, for this to be successful." And I said, "Your performance and your compensation is tied to making these other people successful." Well, that's not my job. Well, it is now. So I think that that you have to make some structural changes. Then you have to have some personnel changes. There are some people that can improve and and have a willingness, and you have to understand who are those people and then which people we need to cut the cord with as quickly as possible because there are some, some legacy issues that are never going to get the company where you want it to go. And then you need to bring in people, and we've already talked about how do you bring in people then that that represent the culture that you want while well, you let the team decide. So I, I think it takes time. It takes um, a lot of face-to-face and, and discussions. Then it changes. You need some organizational structures um, of where things are inefficient. So we change some of the structures of the, of the organization. Um, and then we change some management. And then we gave some new targets for management that – they had to meet on a quarterly basis or they were no longer going to be in their positions. So that's sort of the approach that I've taken as I've come in to different um, technologies, whether it's batteries or software, I've used the same approach, the same methodology um, because it sort of makes sense. And I think I was effectively um, allow the organization to evolve in, in a really positive way. Interesting. So you um you kind of paired manufacturing R and D together, set them similar targets. They had to basically back each other up because that that's like, I guess a big challenge at times, especially in batch technologies. R and D and manufacturing not not working harmoniously. I, I've done it other places. I've given sales targets to to teams that were far removed from the sales organization, and suddenly they're keenly interested in <laughs> in the sales, and it's yeah. remarkable that. That was just never, they were never, they didn't understand why that was their job. And th- this is, you know, a commonality. I, I mentioned the, the, the intellectual curiosity is the, the people that do really well, they want to go to a sales meeting. They've never been to one. They, they think marketing is really interesting. They've never been to a marketing meeting. Uh, conversely, I want the business development guys to be in the lab. Uh, they're like, I, I'm not going in a lab or I'm not going to write software. I, I love going in the lab. I love sitting with software developers and watching them write code. I can't do these things myself. And I think the people that are intellectually curious about those functional disciplines tend to do really well. They tend to do really well over time and to become executive management. Brilliant. So yeah, I guess coming in as a leader, encouraging that sort of interaction, um, I guess you can't really target people kind of going, well, you, you could, you obviously have done, but I guess creating that culture where being curious and collaborating is, is rewarded. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, the, you know, this, it went to the executives to me, and this was the analogy I use going to technology role run companies, is I'm like the, the roadie. They, they make the music. I can't create the music, but, you know, I can book the stadium. I can get the shirts. I can sell the tickets. I can hire the band. I can do all these things. I can't make the music. So I think understanding sort of the other roles around them, particularly people that are really deeply entrenched in the technology, will make a company and a culture successful. Very good. And just a, a couple of uh, final questions. Um, we have uh, venture capital, we have board members, investors uh, listen to the show as well. Um, from your perspective, uh, and this would be a, a relevant topic for them. Um, when do you think is the right time to appoint a commercial CEO? Because 
Um, we work with a lot of companies who have academic CEOs and obviously kind of having an amazing concept and then scaling the company to a certain point. When is the right time to, to make that commercial move? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question, Jamie. And I've given that some thought. Um, when you're really in R&D mode, you don't need a business leader as much. Uh, I think that's a really good time for a technologist, uh, a CTO, a founder to run the company. When that technology is past maybe the 60% completion, maybe 50%, um, then I think those skills become really important so that you make sure that there's a market out there for the technology that they're building, that it can be scalable, that the economics of the technology they're building are feasible. There's a lot of maybe questions that a non-technical CEO will bring. The liability of a non-technical CEO is you really have to trust your people. Um, you, you, you can look at data you know, all day long I can read data. I can't go in and validate the data. So I think there is a little bit of a risk and, and a really good combination is a, is a technical CEO that has run commercial businesses um, so that they've, they've demonstrated uh, their capacity. And it's a very difficult one in, in batteries, in solid state, because no one's commercialized, fully commercialized solid state technology. So everyone seems to be, if they're not in R&D mode, pure R&D mode, manufacturing is very challenging. So I think that, that uh, in this industry, it, it's, it's tough. As I said, it takes so much time. But Series A, you know, mid-Series A, when you start to have your technology beginning to figure it out and you believe you're, you're moving, you can make some changes, but you're moving towards a commercialized product, then I think you really want to have a strong business-minded CEO. It does it could be a COO. It doesn't really matter on the title um, it, into the mix. Very good. I think there's been some really good points from this uh, this conversation, and um, if we can help some companies create a better culture, which obviously then uh, creates culture for success. Uh, and the, and, and the technology becomes viable. They they take it to market with bringing on board the you know the right commercial leader at the right time, who then obviously continues that culture, uh, and ultimately helping those people who want to be a CEO in the future, you know, help them to find the right mentor to make the right decisions in terms of should they join a, a big company or a small company, should they continue in academia or or industry. I think there's a lot that can be taken from this. Um, any kind of closing thoughts on what advice you give someone? who's maybe early in their career in the battery space? Yeah, I, I guess my advice would be, you know, everyone, that first job's really tough. So you don't have options. Often you might have one or two, uh, so you don't really get to pick. So that first job is, is, um, it is super challenging in the sense that the more senior you get, the more you can say, no, I, I don't, you know, interesting job, interesting company, I'm going to pass on that one. When you're, when you're, you know, postdoc or, or just got your master's, that first job is tough. It's very competitive. Everyone's looking for battery scientists right now, whether it's the automotive OEMs, academia, the government, Department of Energy, startups, um, the, the, they're in high, super high demand. So that first job, you need to go and, and probably take it. And that then the, the, the second role that you're in, you can have a little bit more judgment, um, but investigate, really uh, get to know the, as many people there, the leaders, understand their their philosophy. We, we've moved quite a few from Breitbart to publicly traded companies, and what they lost was their jobs were very narrowly defined. The CEO did not care, does not care what they think. They didn't even know the CEO. They've never met him, or they've been at an all-hands meeting, and and I was always proud that our guys, our people were being recruited for these jobs. I had no, I want them to have great careers. You know, I'm happy that they'd go work on, on, on some of the, some of the um, better funded and, and more prominent um, battery companies. So I encourage them. I think what they didn't like was their inability to have macro influences 
on the company. So if that's you, and some people also really like the big company because the money's always, at least the funding's there, if they're public, you know, they, they, they may not have the valuation that they had around their IPOs, um, but you don't have to worry day and night. In a startup, you're, you're going to own it. So um, I run the risk of sharing too much with my junior people, but I want to treat them with transparency. And I think some people really like that and find that that's more rewarding from a cognitive and psychological perspective than being the proverbial, uh, you know, cog in a, in a much, much bigger machinery. So I think it's understanding yourself really well. Um, and as you go forward, the more that you can talk and investigate, there's so much out there, so much information, sort of define where you want to go. Uh, one of the things I would also encourage is to be opportunistic. I spoke several years ago at Harvard Business School, and there was a lot of questions about my nonlinear career path. And they were struggling because generally, and I'm, I'm summarizing some of the, I met with some of the students after I spoke, is they were going to go to management consultants, then they're going to move to strategy at a Fortune 100, then they're going to be CEOs, or they're going to go to a hedge fund, and, or they're going to go to, to Google. Um, so they didn't understand this opportunistic. Well, that sounds interesting. Maybe I'll go learn about semiconductors. If that sounds interesting, mobile computing, you know, at Microsoft. I would encourage them, don't be rigid, maybe, in, in the long term. Be open to something sort of unexpected. And then try and find the best people, whether they're a large company, small company, academic. Find the best people and learn from them. I think that's absolutely critical. And also know if you're suffering your first job, you know, learn as much as you can, get a broad foundation, and then figure out how to make your move from there. Todd, thank you so much. As a closing tradition, um, how do you think the bachelor world would look in 10 years? Are we in the right industry? <laughs> yeah, um, it's a critical in industry. It is a super challenging industry in its capital requirements to scale. Um, I would say we are in the right industry. There is going to be a fair amount of business carnage to get there. Uh, I, I have my opinions about these solid state companies going public years before they have reoccurring revenue as, as someone that manage the PL that we had to explain to investor markets, that's excruciating. So I think that it's going to take time. I think it's a critical technology. And I think that there's better chemistries that we are going to build better batteries. But again, it's going to take a massive amount of capital, uh, particularly if, if there's interest in repatriating the supply chain globally, domestically, uh, and it's going to take decades. So I think it's it's a very worthwhile industry uh, for to be in. I, I think better batteries are a requirement for the future. I think clean energy is a requirement for the future. So I'm very, very passionate about it. But it's going to take patience that other industries don't require. Mm. Amazing. Well, Todd, thank you so much for, for your time today. I really enjoyed the conversation. And um and yeah appreciate your your thoughts wish you the very best with the future as well yeah thanks jamie i enjoyed it thanks for the conversation awesome thank you very much all right have a good day